to and I'll be your host for the day. This is a webinar talking about how to write a good technical paper and to grow yourself technically in the professional world. You need to be inclined with so many things and I think writing technical paper is one of it. We have a seasoned presenter who is good at what he does to talk to us about this. He is currently a shell drilling supervisor on a drill ship in the Bonga Deporter field, offshore Nigeria. He has written papers that are featured in NICE, Offshore Europe, and OTC. He attended the Federal University of Technology, Owe, Robert Gordon University of Aberdeen, and currently a doctorate candidate at the Schema Business School, France. Well, I introduce to you Kinsley Okenyi. But before I hand over to the presenter, I have things to announce to you. Please, so I have decorum in the room. I would advise as you join in, you mute your mic, put up your videos, and you can use the chat box for questions because the questions will be taken right after the program, after the presentation. So we can all share and learn. So I hand over to the presenter. Thank you. Over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, today I want to um, take on a topic, how to write a good technical paper. Um, what I will try to do is to actually um, present it in such a way that um, it's not um, going to be the same when you Google it. Because these days with um, information everywhere on YouTube, Google, it's very easy you know, to get this kind of information. But the thing we've noticed is even if you go on YouTube and Google, right, people, you know, still find it hard, right, to understand and um, to write a good technical paper. So what this will do is um, try and present it differently, right, for us to really appreciate it. Um, but before I start, I will. I will let um, I will encourage everybody to put their mic on mute. So when you join, please put your mic on mute. So the objective, right? Like I said, is you know I want to let you guys know how to appreciate you know knowledge sharing through paper writing. Um, if you don't have passion for paper writing. Um, no matter what you see your mates doing, you know, everybody's a professional and you say, ah, oh, my mate is writing this. If you don't have passion, you can't keep it going. You know, people will have to force you to do it. So this presentation, right, is just going to see how to spike um, that passion in us. Um, next will be, how do I select a good topic? And um, there, is no, there is no criteria, right? In, in telling if a topic is good or not. You know, what, what is actually good is when you, um, what you're present, how useful is it? You know, depending on where we are in life, right? Students, professional, or you know, whatever it is you're doing, different topics might call to you. Sorry, I'm trying to mute Zakaria Mohammed. Who is Zakaria Mohammed? Please mute yourself. Yeah, like I was saying, right? Sorry, you, you can go ahead. I've, I've expelled him. You can go ahead. Okay. So, um, so a good topic you know, simply means how useful is the information I'm pre presenting. And um, this, this, this presentation, right, is going to just show us how to pick a good topic um, depending on the time and the place. Um, if you pick a good topic um, to get published, right, or to even get um, 
your paper accepted, you know, you have to follow a, a typical structure. Um, different conferences, you know, have their own structures. Um, this, again, this paper will, you know, this presentation will explain that, um, or kind of like show or highlight the different structures um, we need to get accepted. Then I'll end um, with the benefits, you know, of getting your knowledge out there. I will share my personal experience, share other people's experience as well. Um, and I hope um, with these four things, I'll be able to tell you how to write a good technical paper. So I'll start with um, the history of presentation, right? Or the history of documentation. What you see on your screens are two um, Greek philosophers. Um, the one to your left is called Hecalictus. So Hecalictus was a philosopher from Ephesus, the Greek city of Ephesus that lived um, 500 years before Christ. Um, he came up with a theory, right? Or a, a paradigm which says reality is a flux. So what this means is that um, things keep changing, right? There is no objective truth that everything um, we see can change, right? Depends on the observer. And with this, um, he got you know a lot of um, influence. He influenced a lot of people. He had his own school of thoughts, and in those school of thoughts, all his ideas right were stored were documented and stored mostly in scrolls and in his students uh, mind and brain um another philosopher philosopher that lived around that time is called parmenides um parmenides theory was that reality as we see it or knowledge as we see it is actually objective right that there is an ob absolute truth what it means is that knowledge has been produced and it's out there it's just for us to go and find it um he said reality is composed of clearly defined entities with identifiable properties and characteristics that has universal pattern so this guy some people say this is what gave birth to the natural sciences as we know it but why am i showing this the reason is <clears throat> These two men were able to present what reality is and what thought is in just these two forms, right? One guy says it's not, uh, it's kind of like subjective, reality is subjective. The other says um, reality is objective. And they were able to influence what we know as um, natural science. This is one of the reasons why, you know, if you look at all our natural sciences, most of our inventions, right, from Newton to Darcy to Bernoulli, all came from this school of thought. These two people, um, 200 years later, influenced Aristotle, which is today known as the, um, maybe the father of science, right? And this shows that presentation or the way we document reality is very important. And in those two guys, right, one guy says subjective, the other guy said objective. The subjective guy does his presentation using a deductive kind of reasoning, right? The objective guy does his own presentation using a deductive kind of reasoning. Now, like I said, the deductive kind of reasoning gave birth to what we know as natural science, which gave birth to engineering. Now, what do engineers do? You know, we graduate from school. What do engineers really do? What we do is, you know, we take mathematics, we take science knowledge, and we take creativity, right? Take all those three things, mix them together, and produce, you know, things like formulas, graphs, charts, um, diagram, right? We document them in, in, in different formats and we present them in such a way 
people can use those things to apply themselves. So for example, an engineer that wants to build um, a car engine, right, needs to be able to document um, the laws of thermodynamics, right, and how it affects um, how um, a combustible car engine can work. And in that, he presents them, you know, he could present them in a code, he could present them in an AutoCAD drawing. But just to be able to produce that car, it's the same thing as if an engineer wants to build a bridge, um, he's able to present um, what a bridge is, right, in structures and forces and things like that. So basically, that's what, you know, engineers do. And that's kind of reasoning, right? You know, still came from the deductive sense. So now, <clears throat> why is this documentation so important? Um, or why it's you know why why does presentation matter? And I'll use about seven um, people to explain it right through the cost of history. So basically, history spanning about two thousand five hundred years. Um, Aristotle is it's one of them, Galileo, um, Ren Descartes, Isaac Newton, Bernoulli, um, myself, and James Omeke. So 385 BC, Aristotle um, was sitting and he was looking at the earth, right? Looking at the world he was living in. And um, he said something like, um, this world, right, has four elements, um, fire, water, earth, and air. Um, so basically, he had information. The world is full of information, right? Just like Parmidi said, how do we observe this information? So he rolled the big ball and um, saw how both the big ball and the small or the small rock moved. And he proposed something, right? He said, all horizontal motion requires a direct course. So what it means is that for this ball to be able to move, right, there must be something that will cause it to move. 2,000 years later, um, a lot of people, you know, use those theorems from the elements to how motion or how mechanics work, you know, to build a lot of things. But 2,000 years later, Galileo challenged that, right? In fact, he actually reversed that statement. What he said is, things will actually continue to move until something stops it, right? And because Galileo was an astronomer, right? So he was looking at, you know, the stars and the Earth and how, why does the Earth keep moving? And he was, he now climbed up to, you know, a place called the, the Tower of Pisa and threw two balls. Right, one was a cannonball, one was a musket ball. The cannonball was bigger and the musket ball was smaller. So when he threw them, he noticed that both of them fell at the same time. And that's how he now he now proposed that. Why do you know he asked this question or his hypothesis? Why does this two ball you know fall at the same time? And that's when he now proposed that things will keep moving, right, until something stops. So what Galileo was able to do was to actually move things from an observatory um, part of it to something he could theorize. And a hundred, about 80 years later, when Descartes, the French philosopher, came up right, and decided on it. You know, he, wrote, he wrote a book, he published a book called the principles of philosophy and said that um, all movements move or all things move in a straight line, right? So he, he got three laws. And one of them is that all things move in a straight line. This was, um, hello, can you guys see my presentation? Someone... I think I'm gonna start presenting. Okay, so 
So he reduced all the the um, how do I put it the the literature or all the theory of Gale Galileo, and reduced all those things to a straight line. Right? He said all movements or all things move in a straight line as long as things don't interfere with it. And this was in 1644. Um, then Isaac Newton was just a baby. Isaac Newton studied Rene Descartes and at age 23 was able to take or take the, the laws of Rene Descartes to an equation, right? So if things move in a straight line, um, it's easier for you to, to, to mathematically represent that. And that's what Isaac Newton did. So he was able to mathematically represent um, motion right with his three laws the first one was the first law of initial and that's the, the first law of initial is actually what um, Ren Descartes said the second was the law of gravity and um, famous f equal to me and this the third one was the equal and opposite reaction so Isaac Newton was a mathematician so he was able to reduce talk right theory to maths and um in 1738 because of the maths we already have right f equal to m a revolutionary things we could translate and even transform you know you know how equations are you could change it you could turn it upside down um you could for for example f equal to m a you can get your mass when you know your force you know once you know your acceleration you can get the mass you can get the force and things like that so you could transformate equations easily and Bernoulli lived at a time where Europe was um, Europe was developing or actually getting some kind of cities, right? And there was a problem in supplying water to, to their cities. So they noticed that if water, if you if you if you are getting water from somewhere that has mountains, right, most of the city will, will get that water when you flow them through pipes. Um, if you get it from a plain, plain land, the water doesn't flow, right? So the F equal to M is Bernoulli converted them to what he called um, hydrodynamics. So basically, he wrote a book, you know, called Hydrodynamics, or you know, then it was translated the strength and movement of fluid. So what Bernoulli saw is that he said, he, he said, he's he saw that when water moves, right, the energy um, behind is always more than the energy in front of it. So basically, water moves, um, as water moves, it loses energy. And I can tell you, 120 years later, Darcy used this equation to give birth to what we know as petroleum engineering. And 274 years later, myself and James, used this same principle or this same equation to actually um, represent well performance using statistics. So now <clears throat> you can see how people over the years, right, from Ar Aristotle documenting things, right, with his students and in schools to Ren Descartes um, publishing a book on the principles of philosophy to Isaac Newton, um, also publishing a book on, um, basically he called it the, the Philosophia Naturis Principia Mathematica. So basically what it means is that natural principles of mathematics. To Bernoulli that published a book or a commentary on hydrodynamics to myself and James in 2012. And the advantages go on and on and on and on. We know what um, Newton's law has done for us, right? From our structure, skyscrapers, bridges, airplanes, rockets. Um, we know what hydrodynamics have done for us, right? Petroleum engineering, basically. Um, even as I speak, the paper, um, Web performance optimization using the experimental design approach. What myself and James wrote is being transformed. About two or three people have called me since 2012, you know, trying to get clarification on, you know, on the mathematical representation we wrote. 
So knowledge has to be document, it's documented, you know, whether we like it or not. The only way we can keep um, getting better, right, is for us to be able to document the knowledge, right? And not those documents also be able to present it, right, in a very good way that people um, can understand and read. So remember the arrows, right, from observation, from information to observation, to theory, to more theories, mathematics and practice. We can twist it, you know, the way we want, right? If we want to present something or if we want to write something. So for example, you can move theory to theory. You could present mathematics to practice. You could present observation to mathematics. You could do theory to practice. And the subsequent slides will show you how this was done um, with different papers. I used um, some of the papers I wrote. And you will just see, you know, once you understand at every point in time, you know, what you have and the resources you have and the thought process you have, you can actually write something. So the first one is the paper, this paper I just told you about wrote in 2012. Um, I did my internship in total in a department called Web Performance. And basically it's, it's, it was a department comprising of about four engineers. And what they do is to try to optimize the way we produce our wells, right? So um, instead of a well, for example, producing maybe 1,000 barrels a day, if you optimize it better, you can actually get 2,000 or 3,000 barrels a day. And so when I went for my master's, I used um, that practice, that witness, right? Say, look, these guys, they do these things, and they do it with a lot of softwares, right? There's a software we use called Prosper. Um, to do a lot of analytical stuff to know uh, or to be able to optimize, you know, how I well produced. So I now said we could actually transform it, this system, right? Instead of using analytical method, we could actually use statistics to do it, right? So I went to theory, went to look for how statistics have been used in different forms. And one of the things we noticed is you know, for web performance, you have a lot of variables that affect your web performance, right? And those variables or those informations come, can be gotten per minutes. So if I'm able to get all these variables, you know, things like what the permeability is, what the, um, the tubing size is, what the temperature is, what the pressure is, water cuts, all those kind of things affect, you know, how, how you flow. If I'm able to combine all those variables statistically, can I predict the well performance? And that's what we did. We now brought up a mathematical you know, equation for that. So you can see how I moved from practice plus theory, and I produce a mathematical equation to predict it. This equation has not been used, right? Right now, a lot of companies to use Prosper. And what we did then is we matched what Prosper, what the real life is, right? So when you bring this equation, you match what the real life is, match what Prosper gives, and match what this equation gives. The paper was trying to show that, look, this equation is actually following the same tra trend with Prosper and real life. So we can actually use Excel, right? Instead of Prosper, use Excel and actually optimize our well. That's what we're trying to show. And we just left it there. You know, we presented it in, I think it was nice in, in Lagos. And a lot of people have read that paper, about 400 and something people have downloaded that paper. Two of them called me. One of them got my, when I joined ResearchGate, said they are trying to, um, you know, most people are doing things on deep learning and neural network. So that they're trying to make sure a robot or a machine actually does it instead of web performance engineers. And my paper struck a chord, right? They saw that I used what we call a multivariate analysis. So different kinds of you know, analysis. There's a linear one, right? Those are basic regression. Then there's the multivariate ones when things change and how they relate. Then there's deep learning, right? Or neural networks. 
basically the foundation of artificial intelligence, where you might not be able to represent, like this my equation is kind of representing things on a line. But for deep learning, it represents things in a box. So they are saying that if this thing can work, right, if something I can present in a line can actually work to, to improve web performance, what of statistics or data that comes in the box, right, using deep learning, can we be able to use it? And um, that was two years ago. Another example was, um, or is what um, James is actually doing now. So James presented a paper in the last year's NICE and actually won the prize um, for, for that. So what they did is they, they, they presented a paper called um, in an artificial intelligence contest, right? Um, web performance monitoring using deep learning. Um, so you can see how if this was not documented, right, in the form of a paper, people will not read it. My ideas might just be lost and knowledge or advancement or development will not even exist the way it is existing right now. Um, the next paper was the one um, me and, and some of my colleagues wrote and presented in Houston this year. So what we did is um, we used the method of practice, practice, then theorized. Um, so the paper was, yeah, the name of the paper is, you know, at this implementation of rigs maintenance operation over drill center, right, to produce drilling performance. So on the rig, um, we install what we call the tubing head spool. So the tubing head spool is what holds our tubing, right? So we drill well to 10,000 feet, run tubing, and what holds that tubing in place is called the tubing head spool. So before we install that tubing head spool, um, first of all, we drill, move off the well, and then um, get a boat to come and install it for us. So, comes, they both install it, leaves, and we come back, right? So we looked at it and said, instead of us having a boat, you know, why can't this rig do this? How we looked at it is, um, we already know that the boat can install the tubing head spool using a crane. On the rig, we actually have cranes, right? Where we use those cranes to get supplies. We use those coins to get supplies. So we combine that practice with the practice of installing a um, tubing hair spool using, using a, a crane from the boat and was able to do it with a rig. And what we noticed is that we saved about half a million dollars on two wells alone. So you can imagine how much you save when you do it on multiple wells. So what we now recommended or theorized was that given the conditions as stated in the paper, we can, you can do things on the boat and save money. Um, another example was um, in 2017. Um, a paper I presented in um, Aberdeen. So what we did is, you know, we used theory practice, theories, um, practice, theories. So we mixed a lot of theories and practice, right? To also, you know, document and um, what had happened. Um, so one of the examples of the theories we did is, you know, at the time, um, the oil price was falling. You guys can remember the 2014, 2015 oil price fall. A lot of people had to start um, optimizing, right? We went to look into, you know, theory and said, look, these wells were drilling. We need to drill them, you know, at a shorter, shorter time, right? Because time, right, is one of the very big factors in drilling. So what we did is wells that we used to use four or five casings, right? We reduced it to just three casings. What it means is that um, wells that can take you maybe 80 days to drill, reducing just taking one casing out, 
you've already reduced that time by about five or ten percent. Um, we combined practice, right? So we went to look at other OUs or other um, companies that are doing very well. And um, the advantage we have is that my company is a global company, so you can go to Brazil, Malaysia, Gulf of Mexico, wherever, right? And you can share knowledge easily. So we sent some people um, to Shell Brazil, right? They went to the rig and saw, because the, the Shell Brazil was very, doing very well, saw what they were doing. And one of the things we noticed was that while we were drilling at, say, 100 feet per hour, people in Brazil were drilling up to 1,000 feet per hour. You know, we looked at and Brazil and Nigeria, if you look at the geology, it's almost the same thing. And why are they doing this and we're not? You know, so we used that practice and improved the rate at which we drill by almost 20%. So there were a lot of other theories. Um, another one is theory of communication, right? So it's a project we're managing, deep water projects. How do you communicate, and a lot of stakeholders, how do you communicate to different stakeholders? You have, you know, this project is done by over 100 companies. And all those 100 companies, they have different things they want, right? Some companies, um, they have different interests. Some, country, some companies don't mind actually prolonging your days, right? Some companies don't mind shortening it. So they ha just have different interests, but you have to align them. And that's the theory of communications where, you know, we, we did. So we got most of them to the room and told them, look, and we have to survive, right? And to be able to survive, it's better I drill this well faster than slower. I know, you know, if, if I drill it slower, you keep charging me per day. But if I drill it faster, what I can do is to unlock other wells, right? First of all, the project is going to go forward. Second, I'm going to unlock other projects, right? And unlock other wells and we'll continue, well, we'll keep drilling. You know, so those are the kind of things we did. And what we showed or what we theorized was that given those conditions in that paper, you can have this improved performance if you do all those things. Um, so sometimes your paper don't have to be this complex. So you don't have to do you know, a lot of theory, practice, mathematics, equations, and things like that. What you can do is, like one of the papers that was, that was um, I think this is the most downloaded paper on one petrol. You know, what the guy did, his name is Tefun Babadagi. What he did is he just um, he wrote a paper on matured field development, right? He kind of reviewed, you know, different different literature on it, theory, and also theorized. He didn't bring any bring out any formula. He didn't bring out any any invention. From all the theory he synthesized, he was able to, you know, also contribute to knowledge. And his paper is is the most downloaded paper on one petrol. Because it's very useful, right? So mature field development is it's um it's a field that has been developed. And most of the big companies, you know, after they've they produced a lot, sometimes it's not really economical based on their overhead. They divest it or they sell it. And when they sell it, a lot of small companies um, buy them. Now the big companies have you know a, a lot of backbone, they, they have a lot of research. They have a lot of people, right? They have a lot of history, information, and stuff like that. The small companies don't. What those small companies do is, you know, they hire one or two people. They don't have a lot of research and things like that. And these people just see these kind of papers very useful because the paper summarizes how to develop a mature field. So one or two engineers can sit in a very small companies or a very small company that has one or two wells and start producing and making money, right? So very easy, theory equal to theory. So very simple. So you don't have to start looking for all practice. I need to go to Brazil, I need to do this. Just look at papers, read them through and find a way to simplify it that it will be useful to an audience you're targeting. Another very simple, um, Way was what Charles Darwin did in 1836. So um, in around that 1800, there were a lot of scientists, right? Scientists were like rock stars, right? They were the Kim Kardashians of today. Um, the British or the English people, they invested a lot in them. 
So what the queen used to do then is they had ships, right, that they sent, you know, around the world. Some of them contain the Royal Navy, some of them contain religious people, and some of them contain scientists. So one of the scientist ship was called the Beagle. So Charles Darwin um, went on that trip and went to South America to go and observe, right? So he stayed three months, um, three years observing on land, on sea, observing animals. You know, he went with a handout. And when he came back to, to England, he was able to write the origin of species. Today, Charles Darwin is known as maybe the father of, basically the father of evolution. Some people still give him um, the title of being the father of biology. So you can see what Charles Darwin did. Observation, looking at different animals, because then in England, you didn't have the kind of animals you have in the tropics. So your observation was limited. You went to South America, saw different kind of animals, different kind of birds, was able to start the taxonomy of those animals and theorize um, about the origins of species. And today, this origin of species, obviously we know how it has helped us, right? From the invention of penicillin to um, vaccines. So, now, we've seen that no matter where you are, right, no matter where you are, you're a student, you're a lecturer, you're a young engineer, old engineer, you can still write something, right? You can still write something. And you might think what you're writing doesn't make sense. Like that equation, you know, we took it a lot to companies that look, instead of, you know, spending so much money on Prosper, why don't you use this statistic method, right, to solve your problems? Uh, they said, ah, no, 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 we can't trust it. But today, people will read that thing and transform whatever you write to something you will not even believe. So today, that Darwin doesn't know his theory is going to help us, for example, fix um, COVID-19. He doesn't know. When he was traveling to South America, he did not even imagine that will happen. And that's because of what he did, right? was able to present or document what his knowledge was. So remember the slide I showed about those two um, philosophers, um, Parmenides and Eucalyptus, right? One was deductive, one was inductive. So now for us engineers, most of us, we are deductive people, right? We, you know, we quantify things. We're able to rewrite quantitatively. So how should I write as a deductive person? Um, mostly, <clears throat> the first thing you do is to ask a research question. Right? Before you start, you have to develop a research question right? or a project question. What are you trying to solve? Um, in my case, right, the first um, example I gave was, how can I do things easier? So that was my research question. How can I do things easier? How can I do things using Excel, right? That's a research question. How can I use do things using just a formula, right? Instead of a whole press, 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 press computer. That was a research question. You know, so you write that down and think about it. Think about it in different forms. So the next thing is you now have to review literature. You don't want to start writing things, right? There are literatures that can help you. You see what we did? In reviewing literature, we're able to see what, um, how multivariate analysis can help us in well performance, right? People like Kabia, Chong, and all those kind of people, what they've actually done in mathematics, right? Um, within literature, you also see what Benoli, people like Darcy, and the likes have done, right, in um, food methods. So then you can now combine them and formulate your theory, right? So we review literature, combine them, formulate, formulated our theory and brought out a model, right? Sometimes it's a model, mathematical model. Sometimes it's also a hypothesis, right? Then after you bring out your model and you can stop, like I said, some people stop at literature review and that's fine, right? Some people stop at theory, formulation of the model or the mathematical equation and that's fine. But some people go further and say, look, let me gather and analyze this empirical data. Right, so the 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 or the test it right. <clears throat> they gather the endeavor and they test the theory. So in my case, 
we're able to test it with real life data and see whether this formula was predicting or following the same tre trend with real life data. So for deductive reasoning, you could stop a literature review like what um, Typhoon did. You could bring out a model and produce a program, right? You could actually even go further and test your theory. But just know anywhere you stop, what well, you just have to do is to recommend, right? Maybe you stop a literature review. You said, oh, this literature was not very clear. I will uh, enjoy or encourage people to study it. Or this particular literature was conflicting this literature. Why is that so? You know, and, and you have something documented because people will read it and people will get insight from it. So for the inductive method, right? I know engineers, most of us do it deductive. But once you start coming into management, and when you start managing people, deductive doesn't necessarily work anymore, right? So you have to go, you know, to the Hecatlitus kind of, you know, believe where things change. And we've been able to solve a lot of problems, behavioral, how people behave, right? Using that philosophy in the sense that if I move, if I take a stone and move it, I can predict what is going to happen to the stone, right? If I pump um, fluid, right, from a tank, right, to my house, I can predict what will happen to the fluid. And that's why I'll be, I can be able to design my taps and my pipes and stuff like that. But we don't, we cannot predict how humans behave. Right, so you can tell someone do this, and the guy, you know, you're not sure if the guy will do it. He can change his mind because there are a lot of variables that we cannot really analytically put in place, and that's why you use inductive method, and it's a different, you know, set of things. So for people that want to write a lot about project management, about people, behavioral science, and things like that, inductive way is the way to go. Right, you start with your research question, you really literature. In reviewing literature, you go and collect your empirical data. So, for example, um, two days ago, I was um, I have a two year old. We we're sitting. Um, he was sitting on the dining right on a chair. He doesn't like using his high chair. So I was feeding him. But the thing about that is that he doesn't sit on the dining for long. So he takes one spoon and starts to run around. So I I told him that look. Um, I'll put you on the high chair if you keep running because the high chair doesn't allow him to move around, right? So if you keep running around, I'll put you on the high chair. So he says, okay, that he doesn't want to stay on the high chair. He starts to cry. So I'll take him close to the high chair. He cries. I won't stay on the high chair. And I'll say, okay, if you won't stay on the high chair, if I put you on the dining, will you run? He says, yes. Uh, he says, no, he won't run. He's going to stay. Immediately I drop him right on the dining. He starts to run again. Right. So I was observing, why is this so right? Why is this guy this stubborn? That's what I was saying in my mind. I tried it like a couple of times, tried to put him on the high chair. He cries and said, okay, no, 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 I'm not going to run away. I put him down. He keeps running. So what I was able to observe is that the way he interprets words, or my hypothesis rather, the way he interprets words might be different from the way I think the words are. So he doesn't have the, um, because for us, right, for us adults, words are like bonds and trust. So when people say, I'm not going to do this, they see it as a trust. For him, he doesn't see the words that deep, right? He just sees it as, once I say this, my daddy will not put me on this high chair and that's it, right? So <clears throat> I can go and look at literature and look at what's, what's, what's is child psychology literature and say, why is this guy doing like this? And I can see a lot of things, right? That say, okay, um, the way they do this, what semantics, how people interpret words differently, and at what stages, um, and things like that. I can be able to now formulate sort of like a survey and share to maybe all two-year-olds or parents of two-year-olds, how do your child behave, right? Do they behave similarly? And in that, depending on what the result comes, right? I can develop a theory and say, do not uh, be angry with two-year-olds or with three-year-olds because at that point in time, their brain is not developed enough to understand the different concepts and dimensions of words and phrases. You know, so you can see how it's different from what we know as engineers or what we know as deductive um, reasons, right? 
But it's very useful. It's very useful in, in project management. It's very useful in places where you have team collaboration, where you need your teams to do things, right? The way you want them to do. And a lot of projects, right? If you go on one petrol, a lot of projects, you know, go the way of this inductive reasoning. So there's also review, right? Like what um, Typhoon did, where he just reviewed the literature. Um, he synthesized that literature. He developed a theory. Um, people saw that theory, implemented it. And some people have been presenting their results on, you know, just reading Typhoon's um, literature and how they've been able to make money um, in marginal fields. So, but with this, this, this um, two inductive, deductive, and review are just three examples I gave. There's a general structure, and most of you are familiar with this general structure, right? Introduction, literature review, methods, and all the way to um, references and appendix. And if you Google or you know watch YouTube video, they will explain all this better. Um, so why should I write? Right, all this story I've just said. Why? Why is it necessary to still write? We know that writing gives you exposure, right? Presenting on conferences gives you exposure. Putting your work out there gives you exposure. So you see your work, or you just you're so excited when people call you um, about what you have written. That's why even you say, ah, does this thing make sense? It doesn't make sense. But people are calling you and, and getting insight. So it gives you that kind of exposure. It also gives you prestige, right? Imagine um, when you know that your work was used you know, for something very important, right? something to save lives, something to make our lives better. It gives you that rigor, right? So for example, you might just theorize something. But once you put pen into paper, you know, start to do literature reviews, start to learn things. You become more rigorous. You understand things a little bit different. Um, you understand things in depth. Um, the other things it can give you, so scholarship opportunities and admissions, right, to universities. So if you want to do an MSc, Masters in Science, you know, one of the things they require you is that you must know how to um, write, right? Um, most scholarships, uh, MSc driven. So if you're right, if you've written a lot of SPE papers, you know those, th those things can help, right? In getting admissions and even getting scholarship, it's also a professional obligation, right? Um, you see how from Aristotle to Bernoulli has helped us to where we are today. Today we can we have an industry called the petroleum in, um, industry. We need to be able to put things down, right? People has helped us this far. How are we going to help people come in in 2000 years to come? Um, most of us are current members. One of the things about um, current in Nigeria is that you need to write, right? You need to write reports. And there are some obligations you need to fill. In the UK, if you're chartered, you need to produce a report. You need to produce a project. You know, So being a chartered engineer anywhere in the world, um, one of the pro professional obligations for you to write. It's also a way to fulfill your SP code. So SP is a professional body. One of the, the the code, right, is for you to write. You can't be an SP member if you've not written even a paper. And again, you can write solely. You can write with people and things like that. And it's legacy. Once it's in one petrol, it's there. It's there for life, right? It's 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 something in two thousand years to come. People will see, just like we're reading um, Newton's Newton's um, books. People will read your book. People will read your papers. Um, so because of time, I will just go through you know type of referencing. There are different types of referencing. Referencing is very important, right? In um, these works are intellectual works. We are calling Newton today is because we know he exists, right? We know he you know he brought out those ideas. You have to reference everybody's ideas, no matter what. what. It's in in, in um, it's actually a crime, right? If you plagiarize, if you bring an idea that is not yours and you claim to be, to be yours, right? So referencing is so, so important in, you know, when we write. And we can go and Google different type of referencing. One of them is, a, or the most popular one is the Harvard um, type of referencing. So that's, that's what's on the board. And 
right now you know the structure right the general structure or at least you know you know where to, how to get you know a very solid structure but there are different levels to papers right the biggest level is when your paper is published right the first level is for you to write an abstract i want to present in this conference maybe in an xp conference or it's whatever conference but the biggest thing is when it's published and publishing means a lot of experts has looked at that paper and have said this paper is known science or it's a it's a, it's a known science or it's a known hypothesis or it's even a law right i'm sure you guys have been reading a lot of covid papers most of them are not published and they will tell you oh this is not published yet but this is what we're seeing right so what you see on your screen is a 2010 um and statistics of all papers on one petrol. 12,432 abstracts have been submitted as of 2010. Um, or in 2010, rather, 12,432 was submitted. Only 451 paper was published. Right. So sometimes you can see 1,080 went for review, but obviously more than half didn't make it. Right. So you submit your abstracts. The abstract is accepted. Um, you present in the conference or wherever. And uh, once you present in that conference, you can go and say, oh, look, people liked it and they think this thing is helpful. Let's do a peer review. Once the peer review is done, then they can publish your work in, you know, for SP, we have GPT, where they publish your work. And publish works are solid, right? You know, it has been peer reviewed. People have looked at it and said, this is, really useful and there are no errors in it. Um, so I think that's, that's it. Uh, these are some of the references I used for this presentation. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much, Kinsley, for that presentation. For me, I know I learned a lot, so I guess other attendees did too. You're able to touch the inductive, deductive, real types of like presenting your papers. Then the benefits of presenting like exposure, scholarship benefits, prestige, professional obligation, filling SP code and all. And types of reference, which I know everybody knows is very important. So you should not plagiarize. So we'll go down to questions. Before that, I would like you all to follow SP Lagos on all social media platforms. SP underscore Lagos. So I'll read out the questions and okay. trying to get. Okay, there's one here saying. Sorry. Okay, how do you overcome writer's block? So um, the way I'll explain it is there are a lot of blocks, right, that usually happen to you when you're writing. So there is observation block, you know, there is a um, mathematical block, and there's also the writer's block, right? The way I try to overcome writer's block is you just keep writing. You know, so the reason why you have writer block is because you are actually trying to edit yourself. Right, trying to say, oh, am I doing something right? Um, is this fine? Is this okay? But just keep writing. You know, keep writing. It might take you a year. It might take you two years. In fact, there's a draft I have on Medium that I've been writing for the last two years. But just keep writing. You know, because if you don't write, right, after you come back to that thing after six months, you start afresh. But if you write, you remember. Um, you will always remember how you were thinking six months ago and things will continue to flow. So the way to do it is just to keep writing. Okay, so here's another question. Would you advise someone to submit his abstract when you are at the verge of finishing your paper? Um, come again with the question. Advise someone to submit his abstract when you are at the verge of finishing your paper? Yes, so there's a paper I actually submitted. I've not finished the, 
I've not finished the paper because I already know the result, right? The, the 2017 paper. I actually wrote the abstract. And we, we knew the result, right? We knew that we had gained a lot. You know, so I wrote the abstract, sent it out because a lot of conferences, you have to write abstracts a year, sometimes a year before the conference. So you can always write your abstract if you know what the result is. Um, there are some topics where and it depends on how you write your abstract, right? So sometimes you don't really know the result, but you've already um, done some hypothesis saying, look, I think this is the way it is. So in your abstract, you can be intelligent enough you know, to write it in such a way that you're not actually saying this is the way it is. And if you get accepted and you're writing your paper, you know, what you can do is to say, look, I thought this is the way things should be. But from my studies or from my maths or from my simulations, I saw something different. Someone else should look at it. You know, so you can you could do that, but you can't help it sometimes to submit your abstract before you complete your paper. Yes, another one saying. How important is it to write as part of a team or group? So um, I like writing as part of a group, right? Because people people have different insights, right? People have different skills. So, for example, when I when I want to write papers that are strong in computing, you know, I write it with James. Right, because he's he's very strong in computing, right? He knows, you know, he knows um, programming, right? Sometimes you want to write programs that are well engineering, but has um or has um a relation with project management, right? So you can get someone strong in project management to write that paper. Um, most times people even look at names, right? So if you write a a paper with a professor, a very known professor, people will say, ah, this professor has peer reviewed this paper in a way. So let's accept it. You know, so they, they, they accept this kind of paper because they believe that ah, this, this guy has peer reviewed about 1,000 paper. For his name to be on this paper, then there's something good about it. You know, so it's very, very important to always write your paper or it helps to write your paper with others. So how does one formulate a research question? So a research question, because if you're trying to solve a problem, right, a research question is anything, anything you're trying to make better, right? Um, any question you can ask yourself, why is, why is COVID-19 virus killing people? That can be a research question. Right. Any question you can ask yourself to get answers. Any question you can ask yourself to to improve lives. You know, so it can be anything. Um, it's one of the hardest things to do when you're doing research, because sometimes you 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 because you're you're trying to also narrow your paper. Right. Um, choosing a research question is very important in that. So to narrow your question, say okay, instead of asking how does COVID nineteen why does COVID-19 kill uh, more people in Italy than it kills in, in Nigeria? Why does it kill more people in Kano than in Lagos? Um, to narrow that, you know, to, to do that is a very complex thing, right? You have to start studying the way people live in Kano, their biology, what kind of virus and things like that. So you can actually narrow that to why people, for example, not dying in Lagos, right? So you, you can see how you minus Kano out of the situation to make your life easy. You know, so it, it's hard, but it's something you learn with practice. Okay. So, um, yeah, is if I submitted an abstract that got accepted for the SP conference and I couldn't catch up with the draft submission, can I submit to the journal directly with the same abstract and topic? So there are some journals that actually take, um, so they, those journals don't do conferences, right? Like SP. So they can actually take abstracts um, directly. So yeah, things like that happen. 
they don't necessarily have to go through a conference. But you have yeah. to basically, so it could be like a school project, it could be a school thesis, it could be whatever it is. Or you don't have, you don't necessarily have to go through a project. Okay, yeah, someone is saying, what exactly did Shell Brazil do differently to achieve 1,000 feet per hour? So, you know, they, they, they looked at their geology, right? And the way it is, is when you drill, you, you, you drill and drill out cuttings out. And those cuttings um, affect your, pre what we call ECD, or your pressures in the world. Now, if you have so much pressure, you break, you tend to break the walls of the wells. And if you break the walls of the wells, you have losses, right? If you have losses, um, you lose what we call hydrostatic head. And if you lose hydrostatic head, then you have an influx. If you have an influx, you have a blowout, right? So that's why people kind of limit the way they drill. Now, if you look at the Bernoulli's equation, right? What the biggest factor there is your diameter. Right, your diameter is inversely, or your pressure is inversely proportional to your diameter raised to power five. And that what affects that diameter is one, your pipe and the number of cuttings you put on that in that hole. Right. And so people looked at it and said, look, I know the strength of this my well, this is my formation I'm drilling. Right. It's stronger than most people think. And because I know the strength, I can actually increase the pressure to a certain limit. And when they, when they increase it, to increase that pressure, then you can actually drill faster, right? So they drill faster. They saw that the pressure increased to a certain limit. They saw that their wells, the walls of their wells didn't break. And they were able to drill those wells and complete them. So we saw it live, right? This is happening. This 1,000 feet per hour thing. Then it was like, man, this is not possible. But we saw it live happening in Brazil. So that's how we did it. You know, and we achieved the same result. <laughs> Sir, how many pages can a good technical writing be? I, I, it doesn't matter, right? So I've seen 20 pages, I've seen five pages, I've seen technical writing. People write um, PhD um, thesis for like three, 400 pages. So what matters is actually the information you're trying to send and how useful that information is. So it doesn't need to be very long or very short. But different okay. conferences have their limits. They'll tell you we need, we, you cannot write more than 20 pages, right, in a paper or 30 pages or 2,000 words or 5,000 words. It depends. Is the deductive and inductive method of writing paper currently in use? What's the question? Is the deductive and inductive method of writing paper currently in use? Yes, it is. So with people use deductive, people use inductive, people use a combination of both. Does SPA accept published papers that are non-petroleum engineering related, say in chemical engineering or mechanical engineering field? So we accept paper in any field. You know, each conference has its role. Right. So, for example, you, a conference will tell you, look, we're looking at technology, we're looking at um, offshore engineering, we're looking at drill bits. So, if you have something in mechanical engineering, in submarines, military submarines, and you feel it can help me in offshore engineering, and I see that paper, right, I will accept it to, for you to come and present in, in SP. So, we accept anything. We accept even medical line, right? Um, things that you can transform that oh this is working in the medical line can we can we apply it in the petroleum industry you know tech in the last sp conference accepted a lot of technical um or tech tech papers like uber you know people saying okay look um i'm doing uber for where well, i'm trying to use the uber method to solve our logistically challenges offshore you know, those kind of papers that the tech guy just an uber guy just came wrote it and we accepted it so it, 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 it just depends on the um, importance on the topic or the team of that conference 
So I think this is like the last question. Aside SP, where else do you recommend a fresh graduate to publish a work, especially at an affordable rate, and is also a recognized journal? So, um, so there's Science Direct. There is, um, you know, a lot of you know a lot of other places to publish. But the first thing is you have to start by submitting your abstracts, right? Then you write a paper, then you present, right? Before publishing, most people don't really get to publishing stage, right? But at least they get it to a conference. So if you go on Google, right? You, there are a lot of conferences that are everywhere in the world, you know, not just SP, everything you can, he, he has a lot of conferences, chemical engineers have a lot of conferences, tech guys, agriculture, you know, just Google them and you see all the ratings. But for us, we're lucky. We have SP, right? And we have one petrol. Um, we are already used to the way SP is, the kind of conferences they have, where they have them, um, when they have them. So it's easier for you to follow through SP. But if you don't want to follow through SP, you can always Google and see where people submit their abstract. An innovative solution based approach. How can you propel implementation of an idea? So um, once your idea is, is, once you present your paper, right, and people like that idea, you can take that idea and invest in it. So let me give you an example. There's a, I think there's a, one of the richest CEOs in the US is this guy that started driverless cars, right, technology for driverless cars. I think it's about 22 now. You know, but when they invested in, company, in his company, he was like maybe 14 or 13 years old, right? He was able to use innovation and machine learning to be able to drive, and cars were able to drive driverless, right, without driving. So right now, he, he owns a company that does driverless truck or the technology that does driverless truck. So people saw it, ah, this guy, you, you know, you can do this. They saw it and they invested in his company. Because it's very useful, right? They saw that this is going to be very useful in the future. So they invested in, in this company. So if your innovation is useful, the way the people will invest in it. You know, in SP, I think the last SP um, conference, someone presented a paper on drilling mud, right? Using Ogbono as a viscosifier. You know, so a lot of people were interested. Wow. You mean we can actually use Ogbono to do this, you know? And you know things like that happen. You know, it's, it's more difficult in Nigeria, but it, it, I, I can tell you innovations happen like that. Maybe after this, I can give you like examples of um, of people that they've actually used their innovations to do stuff. Saying is a draft same as abstract. No, it's not the same. Abstract is different from a draft. All questions and being able to do justice to it. Okay, so maybe we should just give a difference, like persons like give a difference between the abstract and draft before I round up. So it, it, an abstract is is more like um, it's, not, it's not really a summary, but it's what your paper entails, right? You know, in in a, in a lack of a better word, I'll say summary of your paper. But a draft is your paper, for example, minus the literature review it could be paper minus your methodology, it could be paper minus your reference. A draft means you've not finished, you've not finished writing that paper. But the abstract is just a summary of the paper. Yeah, so I can see um, what um, Mr. James said. So, you know, basically he said an abstract is something you're going to present in your paper. <laughs> Very soon. <sweet. laughs> Thank you. Mr. Ra. 
हेलो 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 मिस्टर Section. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I just, I just said thank. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Isura, we can hear you now. We didn't, we didn't hear you before. It sounded like you. Oh, oh, we. Yeah. Okay. So I was saying thank you to our presenter for doing justice to that topic. Like it was very insightful, and it's evidence that everyone learned from it because of the conversation and comments in the chat box. So you can follow SP Lagos on all social media platforms. I posted the link on the chats to be updated on all our upcoming webinars and activities. Thank you very much for joining. Have a lovely day. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone, and thanks, Kesley.